We're now moving on to, to the next session with a very intriguing title of A Tale of Two Tenders. Um, and uh, all I'm going to do is introduce my colleagues and then I can uh, sit back and relax and uh, these guys can do the work. Um, so if I can introduce my far left, uh, Dr Phil Moore. Phil is the Deputy Chair and Medical Director of Kingston CCG and, and also very importantly um, a very valued and active member of the leadership group of NHS Clinical Commissioners. So it's great to, great to have Phil here. Um, but he's also joined by three colleagues who who are either willing or unwilling, but uh, sort of uh, nabbed volunteers to come and talk to us. So we've got Stephanie Royston Mitchell, Ian Griffiths, and Joe Pritchard, and they're going to talk about their experiences. So uh, in terms of tendering, so I'm going to shut up and hand over to, to Phil from now. So over to you, Phil. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Procurement and tenders. What does that do to you? It either strikes fear into your heart, and you think, "Oh, that's going to be really difficult," or some people are gung-ho and say, let's go for it. And uh, I think there's a, quite a division of opinion. Certainly there's been a lot of uh, argument in the medical press about when you have to procure, when you don't have to procure, what you have to do with it. Guidance is beginning to filter out and uh, it seems to be changing by the day. And we thought what would be quite useful for you is if we simply talked about two tenders that have occurred in actuality and what we've learned from it and then we're going to open it up for questions. I'm going to ask one or two questions of these guys and then it's going to be mainly you asking the questions and us being able to have a, a conversation with you involved if we can possibly do that. Is that okay? I'm glad because that's what we're doing. Right, I'm going to ask these guys just to say briefly who they are, you know their names, just say a little bit about what you do, please. Good morning, my name is Joe Pritchard. I'm Managing Director at CSH Surrey. We are a social enterprise, a community provider in the middle of Surrey, um, covering a population of about 290,000, and we've been in existence for seven years now. Ian. Morning, uh, I'm Ian Griffiths, and I'm the Divisional Manager for Substance Misuse and Forensic Services, uh, and I work for Camden and Islington NHS Trust. I've got a portfolio of mainly substance misuse um, and forensic services, so I'm responsible for operational management of services and also developing new business. And Steph? And I'm the Drug and Alcohol Strategy Manager. Steph, put the mic a bit closer to you. That's better. I'm the Drug and Alcohol Strategy Manager for Kingston um, and part of the Mental Health and Substance Misuse Commissioning team and was very much involved in one of the tenders um, that we're going to talk about today. Great. Well, what I thought we'd do to start off is, Steph, you are part of the commissioning team. Talk to us about why you decided to go down the procurement route. What did you really want to achieve? Um, well, it was quite a long process really, um, I think leading up to the actual procurement and tender exercise. Um, we did a big sort of needs assessment, um, that included talking to key stakeholders, talking to service users, um, and really looking at kind of what our services were doing locally and how much they were costing us. I think out of that exercise, um, it became quite clear that service users weren't very happy, key stakeholders weren't very happy, and that something quite drastic needed to change. So we were quite lucky, I think, at this point, Kingston CCG um, came in in kind of shadow form. And what that kind of brought to the table, really, I think, was um, a kind of different viewpoint from maybe local authority or PCT commissioning. Um, and I think we started to look at things a little bit differently. We talked to service users right from the beginning um, and really felt that actually the best way to kind of move this forward was to combine budgets, to jointly commission something that was quite new and quite innovative and really had service users at the heart of it. So Good. we decided to commission our increasing access to psychological therapist service along with our adult substance misuse services into one kind of complete tender. And part of that model was about a gateway service and a treatment service, which was a combination of NHS service providers and third sector providers coming together with service right. users and commissioners yeah. um, to deliver a new service model. Okay, so that's why you did it, because you saw the need that was communicated from the stakeholders, from the evidence, yeah. and from the professionals in the area. Now, Ian, you were one of the companies, companies trusts, that bid for this tender. Why did you go for the tender? What made you decide to tender? Well, we have a strategy of 
always looking at the market and seeing what business opportunities are out there. In terms of the tender for Kingston, we felt it was a very, very good fit. Uh, it offered us the opportunity to develop a service which we were good at. So we had a track record of delivering substance misuse services both within the boroughs and also uh, tenders outside the boroughs. We also felt that we had the right skills in terms of workforce to deliver the services and the outcomes that Kingston were looking for. Um, and also we have got a brief to uh, try and increase our business as much as we can. So that was uh, okay, a so, so that's good. I think from the, the, the people here is if people are writing a procurement specification, I think one of the things that people need to understand is what's going to attract people to bid for this? What was the key thing that you think attracted you? It was part of your core business, it was what you were doing, but what attracted you? Was there anything particular? I think it was, as Steph was saying, it was the opportunity to develop a, quite an innovative service. So the opportunity was there to work very closely with GPs and primary care. The model that we proposed, uh, as Steph was saying, was based on the gateway model, so it was slightly different. So we, we were quite excited about that, and we were attracted in terms of because it was IAPT and substance misuse. They're the two services that we have got a record of expanding. Okay. Great, that's really helpful. Now, Joe, you were part of a different tender. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to say a little bit about what attracted you to tender for the procurement that was being put out in Surrey? We were already the existing provider, and we had been providing services for five years, and we had a good track record. Um, we were known for the quality of what we did, um, good relationships with all our stakeholders, and so obviously we were going to bid for it. It w really wasn't much of a decision to be taken, if I'm honest. So really it was a continuation yes. of existing provision. Were you concerned about that tendering? Because obviously there's a risk you won't get it. Oh, yes. Hu a huge risk. Stressful? Um, exceptionally stressful. I mean, one of the things for this audience is I don't think that anybody can underestimate the amount of energy and time um, that goes into these processes. It is all consuming, obviously depending yeah. on the size of them, but um, for us this was a, you know, a large percentage of our income and therefore it becomes all consuming. How did it affect your staff? The staff were concerned because for them the worst outcome would have been tuping into a different organisation which could have been a private sector organisation, so a very different looking world. So lots of concern and also because the very nature of our organisation, we're employee owned, that would have been a huge loss for them as well. Yes. Um, and you know, clinicians have great relationships with each other and the prospect of you know, unpicking those again for them was really concerning in terms of patients and outcomes. Okay. What we're going to do now is I want each of you to just give us two lessons that you've learned from the process. Now, I do know from talking to you all that you've got an enormous number of lessons that you've all learned, um, but we haven't got time. And I know in our, in our area, when we've done a procurement, we kind of do a lessons learned, and it usually covers about eight or ten sides of A4. I Please, I don't want that. I want a very brief response. Two lessons from each of you. Let's start with Steph. Okay, um, I think from a commissioning perspective, uh, one of the key lessons or value I think that we had out of this process, which was very different to how we'd previously done things, was that clinical input from GPs. Um, and I think it enabled us to provide a very clear sort of strategic direction and leadership, which really harnessed that partnership working. Great. I think the second one, which was key, was um, service user involvement. And service users were really involved in this all the way through the commissioning cycle, um, from the needs assessment process to actually planning the service model, writing specification documents with us, to being on the community wellbeing board, do, taking part in the interviews with prospective bidders, um, all the way through now to actually reviewing and monitoring our services. And I think that just gave us a very different feel to how we might normally work um, and commission services, and that was invaluable, really. Okay, so it was clinician-led, yeah. and it had more than just service user involvement. They yes. were actually embedded in the whole process. Okay. Absolutely. Now, what about the other side of it? Those of you who've done tenders, Ian, do you want to give us what your two lessons you've learned from this? Certainly. The first lesson is that um, the bid in itself is a huge piece of work. It's very, very consuming, as we've just heard, very intense. However, the job's not done if you win the bid. 
the hard work starts at the point that you get awarded the business. That sounds like a voice of experience. Uh, absolutely correct. And what you absolutely have to do is make sure that you adequately resource the implementation and mobilisation. Absolutely critical. And sometimes you can get slightly distracted because the bid uh, presentation's over and the bid's actually been won. Second lesson that we learned was uh, it's again critical to work very very closely with commissioners and engage with local stakeholders if you are particularly if you're bringing in a new service that's slightly innovative and you are a new provider who may not have a profile in an area it's really important to map out who you need to engage very very early and then start that work very very quickly that's something that we've learned. We've since got very good at that, so we've been working with um, local schools, local health centres, etc. But it's easy to forget yeah. that that's something you really have to get right. So two things. One is don't breathe a sigh of relief when you win the bid, because that's not. when it really starts and you've got to resource that. The second thing is really that you, could you just put it into one word? Uh, no, I couldn't actually, Phil. Um, <laughs> two, two or three two words. words yeah. um, speak to the people who will be working with the engage. delivery service. And engage. Engage is perhaps the yeah. thing. Engage with the stakeholders. I just want us to get some things that we can take away. That's all. Joe, different situation for you. So mm -hmm. presumably you had different lessons. Yes. Um, in terms of lessons, I think one of them is that when you enter into a new contract, but with previous relationships all there actually it is a new contract and we are very mindful of that so it's not just a rollover and carrying on this is actually a new contract we actually have now a CCG so it's like a different relationship so for, for us it's been making sure that all of our clinicians are clear this is you know new and we're, we're starting afresh and we're looking at some new and different ways of working has that been a challenge to get through I think for some people, yes, that has, and, um, but it's been a really important message Good. and okay. I think it's been well received by our commissioners. Mm -hmm. um, the other is more of a joint learning, which I think is, is a really interesting phrase in the process called competitive dialogue. And we have been through several tenders and I have yet to really have competitive dialogue. There are meetings, but it's not actual dialogue. And I think there's a huge missed opportunity for commissioners and potential providers to develop more innovative yes. and impressive opportunities. So, remember it's new if it's new, and it means that people have to change the way they work. And the second thing is we need to develop what competitive dialogue really means, mm -hmm. because really nobody's got that pinned down yet. Fine, now, floors open. Who's got a question you want to put? Put your hand up and we'll get a mic to you. One over here, look, please. Just say who you are, where you're from, and then we'll field the question. Uh, hello, Simon Setti, Deputy Director of Commissioning in Gloucestershire. My question is particularly around the contracting stage at the, at the end of that tender process. So how did that work for you, and how tightly do you feel as providers you are now being managed to to deliver the service for patients that, that were set out at the beginning. I think perhaps we'll field Ian for that, shall we, first? Thank you, Phil. Thanks, Simon. Uh, interesting question. The, the contracting aspect of the, the tender is, again, very, very time-consuming. So we have our own head of contracts, contracts manager, who was obviously involved both in the bid and the development of the service. Now, the contract obviously clearly links in with the service specification and there is a lot of negotiation between service providers, the partners that we work with and also our commissioners. Um, and I would say that that's still an ongoing negotiation because obviously the, the contract needs to reflect the fact that we've said we're going to improve the outcomes. Um, and it is quite a complex task, however, with very close dialogue and engagement we, we actually you know, produced that and it was, yeah. it was, it's working very well okay. at the moment. Again, very important in terms of contract meetings, that, that we attend the contract meetings and are held to account for our performance. And I think that is particularly important because it's a new service. So the commissioners have in some ways taken a risk mm -hmm. by bringing in a new service, so we have to make sure we're delivering against what we say we're going to deliver. Okay, Thanks. so how much input do you feel you had into the design of what you delivered? 
we had a lot of input. A lot of input. It was it was actually um, an ongoing dialogue between okay. ourselves, our partners, and the commissioners. Therefore, the, for the contract reflected that involvement as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Yeah. Joe, did you have a lot of involvement in the design, or were you presented with a fait accompli? No, we were it had an interesting sort of scenario in that we went from the contract being actually let initially by the PCT and obviously had a transition into the world of the CCG. Um, in our bid, we put in some innovative models which the CCG liked. Um, and then we had an interesting scenario in the contract negotiations of actually the world was moving and changing. So in fact, what was in the initial tender is actually not necessarily what the CCG wished to commission. Interesting. And I think that's the reality of our world, isn't it? Yes. That life is moving on. Yeah. And so the challenge is to get the contract sufficiently tight that both sides feel they're managing the risk, but equally enough flexibility that we can actually adapt to meet the changing world around us. So and that's what we've tried to build in with an agreement on both sides that we do need to regularly revisit yeah. it and we cannot be inflexible. But there is financial risk, particularly on those of us on a block contract, about how you can manage within that. So one good lesson there is during the contracting process is one time you really do not want the earth to move. Now we had a question here. Um, I'm Francis Hasler from Eastbourne, Hailsham, Seaford CCG and we are about to embark on um, a tender that we, we want to use the competitive dialogue for. So my question is particularly for Joe. What lessons would you say to us about making the best out of our competitive tender process? Yeah, good question. Good question. Joe. So well, our experiences, and as I say, we, we, we've had a few experiences of going into competitive dialogue uh, with different commissioners, has been that they tend to be, you can ask a question or two, but we don't actually develop the content and the detail. And when you have ideas as a bidder, there's a really good opportunity that often in other sectors, not health necessarily, where people actually really begin to develop and actually add flesh to the bones of a model and actually use you know, information from different bidders. That kind of opportunity isn't one I've seen being used effectively in my experience of commissioning. But I think there is an opportunity having those conversations and talking through ideas without everybody being worried about legal challenge or other issues, which seems to be quite a dominant um, issue in some procurement. Steph, you comment on this because my understanding is in the bid that you, uh, the, the procurement process, you wanted the providers to do a lot of the design. Do you yes, want to comment on that? Yeah, that's correct, Phil. Um, I mean, I think uh, just on that point about competitive dialogue, I think it's really important for commissioners to explore the different um, types of procurement in, in the first instance and the benefits that, that can come from those different um, options. But I think we went for um, an option where we very much had an outcome framework but felt that the providers would have the expertise to be able to come up with something quite innovative, whereas we might go with a kind of traditional service model um, that was evidence-based and felt very safe. Yeah. So going with an outcome framework, saying these are the outcomes, you tell us how you can achieve it, okay. I think was quite... Um, Did that feel risky? There was an element of risk there, I think. Yeah. Um, but I okay. think having gone through that process, um, yeah. I, I think it worked really Fine. well. Does that help answer your question? Lovely. We've got another question over here. Good morning. I'm Andrew Keefe. I'm the Associate Director for Mental Health for the South West Commission and Support Unit. Uh, my question, in Bristol, the Bristol CCG, we're currently supporting them in their tender for all of the mental health services, but we're also supporting the surrounding CCGs as well. What would your recommendation to, would be to the surrounding CCGs of the same trust? Having gone through what you've gone through on both sides, both as commissioners and providers, the energy, time, resource that's put into the bid, do you think you could have achieved the change without the procurement, or is all that work worthwhile? Okay, I'm going to start with Steph, and then I would like Joe just to comment as well, please. Um, thank you, Phil. Um, I think it's an interesting question, because I think sometimes actually the um, time commitment and resources that are required um, in terms of the commission in the procurement aspect um, can be very resource intensive and I don't think we always um, take that into consideration at the beginning. I don't think we could have achieved uh, what we did achieve without going um, down the procurement route. Okay. Joe. I've probably got a slightly different view as you might expect. Um, 
clearly we need to make sure that services are in the best interest of patients and the public and we have the right outcomes. But in many conversations I've had with commissioners, they are quite clear about what they wish to see happen. And yet are, they believe, forced down this competitive tendering route. And the resources we all spend, if you actually added up all the resources spent on the providers getting together bid teams, buying in legal support, buying in all sorts of comm support, getting backfill for clinicians, you know, I can go on and on. You can imagine every bid is you know, significant, we're into six figures in terms of resourcing them if they're sizable, and there's a similar expense on the side of the commissioners, with huge bills being spent in particular on legal advice, because everybody is so concerned about legal challenge. When you put all that together, and this is you know, public money, because it will come out you know, one way or other through commissioning funding it, um, this, you know, and you offset this against an outcome that people have already anticipated, you begin to worry about is this the right way of doing business, particularly when some people are still thinking short term around the length of contract. And if you've only got a contract of three to five years, you're going to go down this whole process and begin planning within less than a year off that re-tendering. Okay. So it does feel to me a huge amount of resource with not necessarily the best outcome for patients. Okay. Thank you. Another question up in the middle aisle here. Um, I think just following on for that, I mean, thanks for that. Really got a sense of what was a, a worthwhile but an arduous process. Mm -hmm. I just wonder what the, just rolling back a bit, what the, the reason for the tender was. Was it a sort of staged process? And if so, what was the, the tipping point? Or was it what I call the, the militant tendency of commissioning of get everything out to tender as soon as possible? If, if there was a tipping point, what was it? Um, yeah, do you want me to say that, Steph. Phil? Um, I think, yes, no, we, we certainly uh, had a long period leading up to deciding to go down the tender route. Um, we tried to kind of remodel our services with the existing providers. We looked at um, kind of different ways of working together. And I think ultimately um, the needs assessment, the feedback from stakeholders and service users and from our existing providers at the time was very much that actually without a complete service redesign and retender it just wasn't possible to achieve what we wanted to achieve. So I think in this particular instance we did explore lots of options um, prior to decided to go down the procurement route and I think it's important to do that rather than just think that you have to do that in the first instance but I think in this particular case we had to and I think that was um, common across yeah. all partners. And if I can just step out of role as interviewer for a minute because I am a clinician who's been in 30 years in the area I have had conversations around these services for at least 20 years and not seen outcomes that have really impressed us and I think that was part of what we were getting back from a lot of the GPs, that they were frustrated that things weren't improving. Does that help to answer your question? That's very helpful, thank you. Anybody else? I haven't seen another hand. It's very difficult to see with the light, so excuse me. Any other hands? Joe, from your point of view, obviously you are in a position where you're providing things the five-year point comes and there's an obligation to retend or to retest the market, what would be the optimum kind of contract length and is there an alternative to retendering when you've already run won a tender at the beginning of five years and then five years comes up, is there an alternative that you'd like to see in place at that stage? The, I mean, there is a first question, is, is there an obligation to retender at five years, which as you know has been, has been questioned. Um, we're talking a lot in a, a moment about integrated care um, and we work very closely with our local authority and have integrated services and talking to them they have contracts of sort of 15 years. Now I can imagine many commissioners in the room would be filled with horror at the thought of being kind of lumbered with a provider for 15 years but the issue is if you want to have an effective relationship where there is real investment in the community both financial but also relationships development of a whole range of different um, elements of the service you do need a longer term view and patients I think deserve that as well 
the contract, the NHS contracts themselves, are actually very good for commissioners in terms of managing poor performance, a lack of response. Okay. So I think there's some really good mechanisms there that you can use as commissioners to make sure that the providers okay. deliver and also that we flex accordingly. Thank you. Ian, any final brief comment that you want to put in? Um, it's been a very, very interesting experience, and I think that it's something that we're all uh, slightly anxious about, given that there is so much emphasis on competition. And I think that some of the comments that we heard before was that, it's, that it should not be lost, that the purpose of going out to procurement and tendering is to secure the best outcomes for the service users. And I think that that's the message that we should never, ever lose. That's great. So what's the summary? Procurement is there. There will be a framework in which we have to behave, but procurement is not the first option for everything. Procurement needs to be there to assist commissioners in getting what is really needed for their local population, not in terms of activity, but in terms of outcomes for patients. And I don't think we should use procurement lightly. I don't think we should resort to it quickly, but I don't think we should be afraid of using it if we are absolutely clear about the reason that we are going for procurement. And I think if we do go for procurement, let's create an environment in which the provider has to do more than simply say, we will do this for this much money, but they have an opportunity to create a service that is innovative in order to meet the outcomes for our local populations rather than simply being a dumb bidder as it were they become an active participant and i think probably those are the main lessons that i would take out of this i'm sure these guys would be more than happy to talk to you or share email addresses if you want to ask other questions but thank you for coming to the session and uh, we've appreciated your input and questions thank you thank you